Um, thank you so much for joining us. We know this word will significantly impact your life, so let's tune in. We just started a series last week and it's, and it's called From Poverty to Prosperity. And, and when we talk about the word prosperity, it's almost become a bad word in the church because there's been so many leaders that have actually abused that word. But, but the truth is, it's always been God's plan to prosper us. And in Jeremiah 29, 11, it says, for I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not harm you, and plans to give you hope in the future. Now that word prosper is not, it's, it's a very simple word, and I believe every single one of us want it. And all it means is this, it means to have peace, to be content, to be happy, to make progress, to increase, have abundance, to be healthy and whole. I don't think there's a person in this room that's saying, I don't want peace. I don't want any type of happiness and I don't want to be content in my life and I don't want to have any type of abundance in my life. I believe every single one of us want that. But see, prosperity was not a man idea. It was a God idea. As a matter of fact, it's even God's plan. He never wants to leave us in a place of, that we're destitute. He never wants to leave us in a place that we're wanton or in great need. He wants to help us and take us from a place of need to a place where the needs are being met. I remember when we first started this church, when we first started this church, we were going into the streets and, and we still do that every week on a, on a weekly basis. But I remember particu uh, and, uh, one person in particular and his name was um, Lynn. And Lynn, we found Lynn behind the trash bin and he just moved, not moved, he just moved into the city. He was homeless. Lynn grew up in a home where his mom was a, was a severe drug addict and she introduced him to all the drugs. A matter of fact, the first person he ever did drugs with was his mom at 10 years old. So him and his mother would do drugs for the rest of their lives. They were drug dealing and taking the drugs together. Well, Lynn grew up very angry. He ended up joining uh, the gangs in his neighborhood. And, and he was very hateful and violent and mean. And, and one that up happened, he had a girlfriend. Her name was Mary Helen. And she moved. She she ended up getting arrested in Las Vegas and she was arrested and put in a prison out here in, or in San Bernardino County. So he came, you know, trying to find out where she was and he didn't know exactly what prison she was part of, uh, she, was, she was incarcerated in. So he just came, ended up in San Bernardino. Well, the Saturday before we start our first church service, our adopt -a block team meets up with Lynn behind the trash bin and he's, he's in behind this trash bin, that's where he's sleeping. And he was hungry. He knew no one. He was hungry. We told him, Lynn, um, we're going to have our first church service tomorrow. And we're going to have some Stater Brothers chicken. And some of the ladies are going to make some rice and beans. And Lynn said, I'll come. I'm hungry. Lynn didn't come for a message. He didn't come because we had a great church. We didn't have a church. It was, a, we just, it was going to be our first service. He didn't, he, didn't, he didn't come for any other reason than he was hungry. And he wanted some chicken. And we had the chicken. Lynn came to that first service and he got a little bit more than the chicken. He got rice and beans also, but he got more than that. He actually heard a message that he needed to hear and he started realizing there's an option. I don't need to remain the same in the same place I'm in. So Lynn ended up really put it, placing his faith in Jesus Christ and he gave his life to Jesus and he was saved. Now his condition didn't change too much. He was still homeless and he was still impoverished, but now he had hope. And I remember the second Sunday that Lynn came to church, we gave him an assignment. Lynn, now the second Sunday, he was one of our greeters. He wasn't the best greeter because he still had, he still was like a street guy. And he was like mad dogging, everybody was coming in. So I, tell, I told him, and I saw him, I go, Lynn, you're scaring off all the customers. I mean, this is not your hood. You know what I mean? Just relax. We're here to welcome them and love them. Well, Lynn ended up being a really great greeter. As a matter of fact, he started leading our greeting team. He got to the point that he was so good at greeting, no one knew we found him behind the trash bin. He, we started sending him out to other churches and show them how to do greeting. And he would do greeting training at some of the bigger churches in our area. They didn't know. Well, Lynn was in poverty, but he wasn't going to stay there long because as soon as he came to the Father, as soon as he had started a relationship with God, God was taking him to a place of want. He was going to take him to a place of abundance and every need was going to be met. So Lynn kept coming to church and he started growing and 
and his thinking started changing. And I remember the Sunday that he came, he came and he asked for prayer. He goes, Pastor, can you pray for me? I need to get a job. Now, Lynn wasn't really, had never really had any solid work his whole life. He was drug dealing and, and hustling in the neighborhood. So he went out, I remember that week, and he went door to door, knocked on every business he could find, and he asked them, will you hire me? I'm looking for a job. The problem was that Lynn did not have a license and he didn't have an address. He was living in an abandoned warehouse. He would actually take a, a shower, a bird bath in, one, in one, of the, one of the fountains in a hotel. He'd wake up early in the morning, just get himself together, and he would go out there looking for a job. No one would hire him. Finally, he got to a place and he said, he said to, the, to the manager, the owner, he says, this. he goes, just hire me for free. Don't pay me. I'll work for free. If you like the way I work, then hire me. So they said, well, we can't go wrong. Okay, you got yourself a job. Well, Lynn showed up every single day and worked harder than anyone they've ever seen. They started to realize that not only did he work hard, he was really good at what he was doing. They hired him. They did hire him. He got his first job. And right around when he got his first job, his fiance, his girlfriend, just got released from prison. And now we told him, you need to get married. So they got married that week she got out of prison. They got married in our church. We, we provided everything for them. And then we put them up in a, one of the local hotels. And from that day forward, he never went back to the streets ever again. His life got totally transformed. He was moving from poverty to prosperity. What happened with Lynn later on, he started realizing his faith started to build him because, see, poverty is a mentality before it's a condition. He started thinking, wait a second, I could do more. And he got himself a union job. Today, he is making over $100,000 a year, has his own company truck, and he has a crew that's working for him. From poverty to prosperity. These are stories that I could tell you over and over and over. Today, we're going to dive into a story in the Bible. Literary scholars, uh, maybe a few years back, they began to ask themselves, what is the greatest short story that has ever been told? And this is when they, when they got the survey back, 70% of them pointed to one story, and it was a biblical story. And today we're going to share that story with you. He said, what is the story? It's the story of the prodigal son. Let's look at Luke chapter 15, verse 11. To illustrate the point further, Jesus told them this story. A man had two sons. The younger son told his father, I want my share of your estate now before you die. So his father agreed to divide his wealth between his sons. Let's look at this scripture for just a second. This man has two sons, and one of them is seeing the wealth of his father, and he's thinking, man, I can't wait till my father dies so I can have his wealth. This young man was maybe secretly thinking, Dad, die. I don't want to wait until you're old to get your money. He must have been thinking about this for a while. And then he gets the guts to stand up to his father and say, Dad, I thought of something. I don't want to wait till you die to get your stuff. I want your stuff now. So the father said, Okay, and the father kind of acted like he died because he gave both sons the full inheritance. There's a problem with this son. This son is choosing money over relationships. And maybe he's even doing this. He's choosing pleasure over people. Maybe that was his motto, pleasure over people. I live for the moment. See, this young man was going to get that inheritance maybe later, but later was for him better. 
Because he wanted the promise, but he didn't want to go through the process. And in that process of waiting and maturing and building his character and learning how to run his father's business, he would have learned how to manage money. And when, we'd have, and when he got the money, he wouldn't have wasted it. He would have learned how to invest it and be a good steward. Be careful that you're not trying to participate in things too early. What I mean by that is there's a time to get sexually active. And I'll tell you when, when you're married. Don't put the cart before the caballo or the horse. There's a time to say, well, well, does God not want me to enjoy the pleasure of sex? No, he does, but he wants to, you to enjoy the pleasure of sex at the right time in a committed relationship. Don't put the cart before the horse. There's a process of preparation for every blessing. This young man doesn't want to go through the process. A matter of fact, he wants to take a shortcut. And there's a spiritual principle that you need to know that hasty shortcuts lead to poverty. Shortcuts do not lead to prosperity. They don't need to lead to abundance. They don't lead to peace. They actually lead, to, lead us to a place of want. So this young man made up his mind, I want my stuff now. And his dad agreed. Now, why would his dad agree? And I'll tell you why the dad agrees. Because every single one of us have freedom of choice. This father that's in this story represents our heavenly father. This son, and when you hear the rest of his story, he said, man, what a scoundrel. But this son actually represents every single one of us. How we have chosen pleasure at times, things at times, over our relationship with our heavenly father. So this young man is fantasizing. He gets the money. And when he gets the money, three days later, he does something. Let's take a look at it. A few days later. A few days later, this young, younger son packed up his belongings and moved to a distant land. And there he wasted all his money in wild living. So now he gets the money. He has the money. I don't know how much money it is, but it sounds like this father had a lot of money. So maybe it's a million dollars, a million dollars. And while he has the money, he's thinking for three days at least, he's thinking, what am I going to do with this money? He's not thinking about his father. He's not thinking about his brother. He's not thinking, what, he's not thinking about investments. He's thinking, what fun am I going to do with this money? So he's thinking about it. And finally, the money is burning a hole in his pocket. And he's thinking, the things I want to do, I got to go to do it. Because I can't do it here in my father's house. Because in my father's house, there's structure. In my father's house, there's rules. In my father's house, there's correction. And what I'm ready to do is not going to fall under my father's structure and boundaries. But he didn't realize it was those boundaries that were causing, that, in that structure, that was causing the prosperity in the house. The word father means source. Say with me, source. So he was actually leaving his source. His source of peace. Joy. His source of wisdom. He was leaving his source of provision. And this is what happens when we leave the Lord. We're lead, leaving our source. So he leaves. He's gone. And he doesn't go, we're in San Bernardino. He doesn't go to Rialto. Or he doesn't go to Highland. He goes to a far away land. He goes where no one knows his name. Because when we are ready to do a dirty deed, we want to go somewhere far. 
What happens in Las Vegas stays in Las Vegas. And Las Vegas is too close for some of us. You go to Las Vegas and you see some of your church members. Hey, hola, what? I'm, I'm good, I'm good, I'm not doing nothing. What about you? I'm not doing nothing either. So he went to a foreign land. I think he probably even went to a place that they even spoke a different language. So while he was taking his drugs and drinking and calling his prostitutes over the house and his buddies and him were partying, no one would tell him nothing. See, while he had the money, he thought, I got it made. But every day that he was away from his father, he was wasting his life. His life, was, it wasn't being invested. His life was becoming 100% useless. So let's take a look at this. There he wasted all his money in what? Wild living. So what is wild living? Wild living has to do with immorality. It has to do with partying and parties that have a lot of drinking and getting drunk. And maybe today would be about getting high, sexual morality. And even let's put some prostitutes in the mix. And we know he had prostitutes because when he comes home eventually, after he, after he does all these crazy things, he has an older brother and the older brother says, you're welcoming, welcoming him back after he's been spending all his money on wild living and prostitutes. So he's doing this, he's spending his money. But let's, look, let's keep going. About the time his money ran out, what happened? We have just money. See, every day, every day he was separated from his source or separated from his father. He was becoming every day more impoverished. He was becoming more depressed, more miserable, more condemned, more hopeless. A life apart from God only leads to spiritual and life poverty. It's kind of like this. Have you ever cut off a branch off a tree? When you cut a branch off a tree, it still looks like it's alive. But actually, as soon as you cut it off, it's dead and dying. We're living in a world right now that has been running wild. And maybe some of us in this room, you've been running wild. And maybe you're still thinking, I still got one more play. I still got a little money left. I still, come on, just one more time around the block. But every day that you're separated from God and separated from your purpose, this is what's happening. You're dying. And one day, you're going to do your final run. You're going to run out. And when you run out, who's going to be there? You know who's going to be there when you run out and when you're in trouble, all your friends will be gone. But there's going to be a father that's still looking out for you and saying, son, come back home. You don't need to stay out there on the streets in poverty, in lack. You don't act like you don't have a source. So he ran out. He ran out of money. It's crazy. Have you ever run out of money? Have you ever run out of money when you're in sin? Like, have you ever run out of money and you have an addiction? That's the worst. <laughs> you start, you start, yeah, you start, she said, you start getting creative. You start doing yard sales on other people's stuff. You start looking at other people's cars on Christmas and say, there it is. There, that, thank you, Jesus. <laughs> I 
running out. See, the worst thing about it, he was, he ran out of money, but he still had a bad habit. He ran out of money. Come on. He ran out of money and he had no one to help him. He ran out of money and he was in a land that he knew no one. Question, what are you running from and what are you running to? Could it be that you're running from something you should be running to? And you're running to something you should be running from? Because you are headed somewhere. And either you're headed to massive pro poverty or you're moving towards prosperity. Either you're moving towards want and lack and emptiness and depression or you're moving towards joy, peace, victory and overcoming. Well, this guy was running the wrong direction. Now, about the time his money ran out, about the same time his money ran out, a great famine swept over the land and he began to starve now. Like, you know what's happening now? He's going from bad to, he's going from what? Bad to, now, when we are on the wrong track, it will go from bad to, when we're running from God, it's going to go from what? Well, I don't know, man, it's pretty bad right now. Get ready. The next one's going to be worse. Now, I'm not saying the devil won't give you a little break and make you think you're okay now. Because just when you start thinking, man, I got to make some changes, the devil just back up a little bit and say, okay, no, okay, 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 you're good. Right around this time, when you run out of everything, you're ready to run back to the house of God. One of your crazy friends has a free hit for you. Free, free, free. Right about when you're running, to, ready to run back to the house of God. Your old girlfriend didn't want nothing to do with you. Hey, how you doing, baby? I was just thinking about you. Como talez vous? She starts talking French to you. And you start thinking, oh God, okay, okay, I'm good then. I, I still, I'm good. No, you're not good. It's going to go from bad to worse. All it is, is the same bait that got you there. The devil just keep throwing the bait and he's pulling you in. So at the same time he ran out of money, same time, now there's a famine in the land. You know why, why there's a famine in the land? There's a famine in the land because that whole land was separated from God. And that whole land was moving towards poverty. The people that you're joining with are gonna determine what kind of life you're gonna have in your future. They were in famine, he's in famine. The question is, who are you running with? Because who you're running with is where you're headed. Their results will become your results. Maybe it's time to stop running with some of the people that you're running with because the people that you're running with, they're only, only going to lead you to the same place that they're headed. They're going towards a famine and you'll be starving too. This boy's starving. And he comes from a home that his daddy, like this, this, his daddy has servants in his house. That's how rich he is. They don't even have to clean up in their house. They got people wash their dishes and cook for them. Vacuum, do the lawn. Amen. I need, some, I need some help with that right now. But the scripture says, really, those servants were living in abundance because they were in the right house. 
And though this kid here, this son here, had the right bloodline, he was in the wrong place. He had provision, but he chose to walk away from his source. This is, this is, this is really something to think about. Are you thinking about walking away from the church? Are you thinking about walking away from God? Are you thinking about walking away because there's a pleasure that's calling your name? Because that pleasure that's calling your name is actually poverty. It's going to take you to a place of want. It's going to take you to a place of need. It's going to take you to a place of unhappiness. It's going to take you to a place of addiction. It's going to take you to a place of major lack. Because I don't think he thought when he left home, this is how it's going to end up. We got too many short-sighted people. All we could do is see the pleasant pre pleasure. Oh my gosh. We're like a dog in heat. How do I know? Why am I talking about that? Because I got a dog. I got a little dog that's in heat. And then I got my big, massive, bully, pit bull dog. And a little dog like this big is in heat. If they get together, she'll just die. <laughs> but that's all he could think about. He's like, <laughs> <laughs> I got to keep them separate. He, he's crying like the world's ending. <laughs> he's so short-sighted. <laughs> Many of us are short-sighted. You're panting for your sin, but you don't realize where it's taking you. It's taking you to a place to destroy your dignity, destroy your family, destroy your future. To, come on, destroy your ministry, destroy your name. And God is saying, come on, I'm waking you up right now. Prodigal, come back home. Now, you might have not done it yet, but you're thinking about it. And because you're thinking about it, you already got prodigal thinking. And when you have prodigal thinking, you're gonna, next that falls is prodigal living. And after prodigal living come prodigal results. Starvation. Starvation. It means to be in want. It means you're at a place now that you fail to reach your goals. It means to fall short. And it also means to go from bad to worse. So there was a famine in the land. He's joined with people that are, that are famine people. And now he's experiencing famine himself. In his dad's land, there's no famine. In his dad's house, there's no famine. It's in the land he's choosing to associate with. You do not need to remain in famine. You do not need to, st you do not need to stay in want. There's a God that can supply every single one of your needs. Let's keep going. It's a crazy story here, little scoundrel. Don't judge them because it's you. It's me. So now, great famine swept over the land and he began to starve. He persuaded a local farmer to hire him and the man sent him into the fields to feed the pigs. The young man became so hungry that even the pods he was feeding the pigs looked good to him. But no one gave him anything. You know what this represents? That he went lower than he ever thought he would go. He was a Jew. Jews wouldn't look at a pig, touch a pig, much less eat a pig or feed a pig. It was considered an unclean animal. If there were demonic, uh, demon, spirits of demons, what they would do is go to the father and say, Father, I got your son at the lowest place he can go. He's feeding pigs. And now his fantasy is to eat pig slop. 
Are you eating pig slop? Food for pigs, not food for, for God's children. The Bible says you cannot eat at tables of demons and of the Lord at the same time. All I'm saying is that the devil has a pig diet. And the sad thing is many believers are on a pig diet. They desire the things of this world more than they desire the word of God. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. He's fantasizing. He goes, you know, if I get this job feeding the pigs, maybe I could eat a little bit of the pig food. But you know what's so crazy about this story? He's feeding the pigs and there's no leftover food. The pigs are eaten and he's not eaten. As a matter of fact, he's in a position that he's lower than the pigs. Sin will take you lower than you ever been and will cause you to entertain things and people you would have never entertained. You go to a place that you're with a guy you would have never looked at three years ago. And all of a sudden he looks attractive. Like, he cute though. No, he ain't. Ugly. He has an ugly attitude. He's no good for you. He's abusing you. He's hurting you. There, there, there's nothing good I see in this. I don't know, but I see something. You know why you see something? Because this is what happened. You, this, your self-worth has dropped down so low. You start thinking like, uh. Hmm. Praise the Lord. The, look at this. He was feeding the pigs. So hungry that even the, the pods he was feeding the pigs looked good to him. Pig food started looking good to him. <laughs> you know what's so bad about getting addicted to pig food? You start liking it. Oh my gosh, I can't wait to get some more pig food. I don't, I don't even need to go into detail what pig food is because you know where your pig food has been. Stuff you've been feeding your mind, stuff you've been feeding, come on, feeding your, your flesh. Praise the Lord. Keep going. Someone, someone just got blessed right there. Look at this. But this is super good. But no one, but no one gave him anything. Who didn't give him nothing? No one gave him nothing. You mean all the friends he partied with, none of them helped him? No, because this is why, because they were in the same condition he was in. They were all, every man for himself. You're going to find out who your true friends are when you're in trouble, when you lost everything, when, you're, when you run out of everything, you're going to find out all your friends are gone. But come on, it's time for you to come to your senses and start doing some inventory. If they're all gone, who's not gone? And you're going to find out the church is not gone. God is not gone. Your brothers and sisters in the church are gone. When he finally came to his senses, praise the Lord. He said to himself, someone say, he said to himself. He finally did. See, the first step to change in your life is changing your self-talk. What have you been telling yourself? Because he was telling himself, if I just get the money, I got it made. And all of a sudden, he came to a sense, he started saying, I got to tell myself a different story because the story I'm telling myself is a lie. He said to himself, at home, even hired servants have food enough to spare at home. It's time for someone to come back home. And here, I'm dying of hunger. I will go home to my father and say, Father, I have sinned against both heaven and you, and I am no longer worthy of being called your son. Please take me in as a hired servant. Change is happening. 
because his mind is changing. The most powerful change is a change of mind. You could change your shoes, you're the same person. You could change your dress, you're the same person. You could change your do, change the color and everything. You're the same person. You get your nails done, did? Same person. But when you change your mind, it will change your heart and it will change your direction and it will change your future. There's nothing as powerful as a person that just made their mind, I'm just going to change the way I'm thinking. Changed his mind and then he made a decision. Say it with him, made a decision. I'm going to go back home. Just like he made a decision to walk away from home, he made a decision to come back home. If you're man enough to walk away, be man enough to walk back. Walk back. Admit, I walked away. The other thing that happened in this moment, he said, I've sinned. You know what that means is? He wasn't blaming everybody for his condition. See, you'll never, you'll never go from poverty to prosperity until you make up your mind. I'm in the mess I'm in by the choices I have made. The good news is there's an option for every single person that's willing to be honest. I am done feeding the pigs. I am done fantasizing about pig food. I want to go back home. Daddy, I don't, I'm not even worthy to be called your son, but just even make me a servant in your house. Is there something wrong with him saying, just call me a servant? I go, well, there's something wrong, but not something wrong. Kind of, kind of not, kind of, kind of, kind of, not, kind of. Because this is a kind of not because he realized what I've earned is punishment. What I've earned is a downgrade. The choices I've made, I don't deserve to be restored. So he started looking, what I deserve is to be a slave, never a son again. But God doesn't think that way about you because this is all about grace. It's not what you've earned. It's what Jesus already paid for. And what he's saying, you left a son and you're going to come back a son and a daughter. You left, come on, you left prosperous, you're going to come back into your prosperity. Come back to the source and you come back to your restoration. You come back to your new beginning. You come back to your provision. And this is it. So he returned home. Someone say he came back home. This is a message for somebody. It's time to make a decision. Come back home to your father's house. Come back home. We, we welcome you. God welcomes you. Look at this. He came home to his father, to the source. And while he was still a long way off, his father saw him coming, filled with love and compassion. He ran to his son, embraced him, and kissed him, and kissed him, and kissed him, and kissed him. And you know why I say kissed him, kissed him, kissed him, and kissed him? Because the word kissed him means to kiss again and again and again and again. His son said to him, Father, he's very practiced this, I've sinned against both heaven and you. I'm no longer worthy of being called your son. But, it's, but his father said to the servants, quick, Bring the finest robe in the house and put it on him. Get a ring for his finger and sandals for his feet. And kill the calf. We have been fattening. fattening. We must celebrate with a feast. For the son of mine, this son of mine was dead. And now he's returned to life. He was lost, but now he is found. So let the party begin. So when a prodigal comes back, 
This is not a time to be judged. It's not a time to be condemned. It's not a time to put the man down or the woman down. It's a time to party. It's a time to love. It's a time to kiss. It's a time to hug, embrace, and let's kill that fatted calf. He said, get him the best robe. Not just get him a robe, get him the best robe. And you know what the best robe was? His father's robe. It represented the father. So he said, get the best robe. You know, that's my robe. Put it on him. So now when they see him, they see me. It's my righteousness, it's my level. I put him on my level right now. Here we go. I see him in heavenly places. He's no longer a prodigal. He's no longer in poverty. You're not going to look down on him. Look at his robe. He got the best robe. Give him the ring. The ring had the family crest on it. It was like a credit card. You know what it represented? Full access. So he could go anywhere and they would put it in wax. And, it, and, 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 then, and then he could go anywhere and buy anything. Because what the fathers could afford, he now could afford. You know what God's saying? You were in poverty, you ran out, but now you're back to your source. And everything I have is yours. Just ask me and you will have it. Then he put us sandals. You know why he put his sandals? Put the sandals on them because the slaves had no shoes. Only sons had shoes. So it represents, you're my son, sonship. Every time you're walking, you know you're representing me. You're a son. You're not a slave. Come on. You're not a prodigal. You're my son and everything I have is yours. I love you, son. Let's party because my son, my daughter has come back home. Let's give the Lord one more praise. If this message has been a blessing in your life and you would like to show support, please comment, like, share, and subscribe, or click the link below so that you can contribute to our ministry. Thank you and God bless.